Hello, Kidney Warriors. James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach. And this is another episode of Dadvice TV Live. And for those of you out there who are new, go ahead and say hello in the comments. Introduce yourself. We have a great community here and they would love to meet you. Now, if you are new, let me introduce myself real quick. My name's James. I have kidney disease. I was diagnosed at stage five, which was heartbreaking. And I was told I needed to go on dialysis. Well, I never went on dialysis and I haven't gotten a transplant. Instead, I focused on my health, worked very closely with all of my doctors, including a renal dietitian, started exercising, dancing, moving, eating much better, and got my blood pressure looking fantastic. All of that helped improve my overall health, which helped lift up my kidney health. I'm now stage three, but more importantly, I don't suffer a single symptom. I don't let kidney disease hold me back. Now tonight, we're gonna to talk about something that's really important to everybody out there, not just those who have a chronic illness like kidney disease. We're gonna talk about advanced care planning. And to help us talk about it, we have back from sunny and warm Hawaii, and I'm jealous of that because it's starting to get a little warm here in Cincinnati, Ohio, but we're still got a little bit of snow on the ground. Everybody welcome Lana Life. Hey, Lana. Hey, everybody. Happy Thursday. <laughs> Woohoo! Now introduce yourself to those that are new. Well, hi, I, yeah, like James said, I'm a therapist here in Honolulu, Hawaii. I have worked in the healthcare industry for, you know, quite a long time in various settings. Um, I worked for the National Kidney Foundation for a while, worked in a couple hospitals, worked in a skilled nursing facility and, you know, nursing home. So my background really is health. Um, and my favorite part of the whole health picture is really getting to learn people's stories. And that's what I think is so great about, you know, being here on Dadvice TV is it's really getting to honor everyone's stories um, as they as they go through life. I love it. Awesome. And we are so glad to have you here along with all the other professionals that volunteer their time to help educate us that are out there and make it easier for us to manage life and our illness so we can improve our quality of life. And as I like to say, kick kidney disease to the curb. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now tonight we are talking about something called advanced care planning. As a matter of fact, I had to do a little bit of research about it and it's something I should be doing and I haven't which is uh, just just because you know, I'm getting up there in age, so I should at least start thinking about a lot of those <laughs> things. Um, but it's important for everyone. So what the heck is advanced care planning? So advanced care planning is taking the time to think about, talk about, and write down your healthcare wishes. So, I mean, we are human, and, you know, as we get older, you know, we may start to get sick, we may get into an accident, you know, life happens, we're not going to be here forever, unfortunately, none of us will be. So advanced care planning is really the wonderful option and opportunity to inform your loved ones and really consider for yourself um, and inform your healthcare team, you know, if something were to happen, if you were to become ill and couldn't speak for yourself, what kinds of treatment would you want? What is important to you? Who would you want to make decision, decisions for you? And really just kind of outlining what is important to you and, and helping everyone really amplify your voice even when you can't speak for yourself. And there are certain documents that kind of help you with this, correct? One of them is um, an advanced directive, which is part of mm -hmm. this, right? Correct. So that was one of my big roles working in the ICU. So when someone would come into the hospital, um, one of the very first things I would do is I would reach out to the family and figure out, does this person have an advanced directive? And hopefully they did. Um, more often than not, they did it. But if they did, it's such a rich document because 
it allows us to know right away who is the decision maker. Um, you know, if has this person, when was the last time this person completed this document, right? So if it was completed in the 90s, you know, figuring out has anything changed? Has the person they identified as the decision maker, is that person still around? Um, you know, stuff like that. But it really gives the team, me and the family, that perspective of like, okay, this is the person's voice who can't speak to us. This is what they want. This is what's important to them. Yep. And who all should be doing advanced care plan? I mean, it's it's kind of obvious. Those that, you know, we had someone mention um, they had a relative who has terminal cancer. Definitely they want to get their wishes down. Um, but are there other people besides this, just them who should be doing this advanced care planning? Yeah. So anyone and everyone over the age of 18 should have an advanced directive. I have one. Um, if you ask any of my loved ones, if you ask any of my colleagues from the hospital, they can tell you where my advanced directive is stored. Um, every single person over the age of 18 should have one. You know, accidents happen. We're living through a pandemic. You know, illnesses happen out of nowhere. And, you know, it's, it's just so important to have. It's why we call it advanced care planning, because we don't know. We can't really control what's going to happen or not happen in the future. And it really gives us that opportunity to have our voice heard. Um, you know, yeah, so people with chronic conditions, um, people who have been diagnosed with a serious illness, people who have been diagnosed with a terminal illness, their condition maybe has declined. Um, they've had a loved one die. You know, they've, those are all really, really good times to consider, you know, well, what's important to me? You know, should I complete my own advanced directive? Should I, you know, be having these conversations with my loved ones? And the answer is absolutely yes. So everyone should create an advanced directive if they're 18 or older. And, and what all gets defined or planned out in one of these advanced directives? That's a great question. So in advanced directives, it's who would you trust to make decisions for you first and foremost? I actually have an advanced directive with me. Um, every state is different. Um, you can get online and you can research, you know, um, it, just Google advanced directives. And, you know, a lot of times your state or your, your state should have, you know, information about how to complete it and that kind of thing. Um, but if you look on the advanced directive, I'm not sure how well you can see, but I'll hold it up close. So the very first part is, you know, who would you choose to be your decision maker? And I mean, that is first and foremost, um, you know, really, really important. So you can, um, well, so first, actually, the first part is like, you and whose document this is. But the first part of the document is who would you choose to be your decision maker? Um, then the second part of the document is specifically what types of life sustaining treatment you would want in the event you're in an emergency. Okay, so that would be things like, do you want CPR? Do you want a breathing machine? Do you want dialysis? Do you want a feeding tube? And it's important to note that when we are talking about life-sustaining treatment, we're not talking about, okay, I have a heart attack, and if I say I don't want CPR, that EMS wouldn't do that for you. It's once the EMS gets you and you are medically stable and you're at the hospital, do you want dialysis for the long term? Do you want to be on a permanent feeding tube? Do you want like a trach, something you know that is uh, it's a surgical process? And, and, and these so are in it, case you can't speak for yourself. If you can speak exactly. for yourself, you can make the decision. Absolutely. At that time. But if you can't, right. we're kind of saying, hey, I've thought this through. Mm -hmm. I, here's how far I'd like you to go. As a matter of fact, I, I'm thinking of a exactly. relative of mine last year who had terminal cancer. And as a family, we did this for her. And mm -hmm. my mom was the one making the decisions and she planned everything out. Um, not, not just what was going to happen at the hospital, but once her life ended, what would happen and even yeah. how she was going to live up to 
needing hospice. You know, what was she going to do? She sat down, thought it all through and made it clear to everyone and documented it. Uh, I don't know um, what all paperwork was involved. You know, my mom was a decision maker, so I know they had to do a lot of paperwork. Um, But yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. And so a lot of people get caught up, you know, with the paperwork, right? So does it have to be notarized? You know, so there's a lot of myths that come into advanced care planning. So, you know, does it have to be notarized? And no, it doesn't. Um, It just has to be witnessed uh, by two people who aren't your decision makers. So in the state of Maryland, um, social workers in the hospital, we could witness the document, but here in Hawaii, social workers, no one in the hospital is able to um, witness the document. So it has to be two people who are not a part of your healthcare team and who are not listed on your advanced directive as your decision makers um, to ensure that, you know, you understand what you're writing. You're not being coerced in any way. You know, there's no financial gain or anything like that that's going to happen. And so it, it becomes, it takes on this life of its own when it's really a document um, that can be completed for free and can be completed, you know, at home. It can be completed, you know, with a, you know, with your doctor, that kind of thing. Now, now Steve, the kidney nurse, Steve Belcher RN, he had a question. Um, what if you don't have a friend or family member to name on the document, but you know, here's what I want mm-hmm. to happen. Yeah. And so, So there are different parts of the advanced directive um, that you can just kind of mark out. So I've had that happen um, where we've had people who are, you know, living here. They don't have any family members. um, And so what do we do? You know, who do you call? And so a lot of times, actually, they would cross off the decision maker piece and they would just put these are the decisions that I'd want to be made or this is where I'd like to go, or I have a, um, a burial plot set up here. So you can do that. And also I've had people who have absolutely no one else um, list their doctor. And so a lot of times the doctors don't necessarily feel comfortable making the decision per se, but what it does is it gives the medical team at the hospital a chance to talk with the doctor and say, you know, in your discussions and seeing, you know, Lana, you know, throughout the years as her primary care physician, has she ever talked about it? What kinds of things has she shared with you? Do you have a copy of the advanced directive on file? And so even if they're not comfortable making the decision because of conflict of interest, right, ethically, um, they can still give that insight. So that way we know, okay, here's where we go. This is a little bit of insight mm-hmm. into what this person was was thinking um, this is what they shared time and time again is what's important to them. So it gives us that insight that we absolutely need because we can't talk to the patient. Now, if I create this document, where do I store it so that if it is needed, people know, hey, he's got mm-hmm. one. Uh, you know, for example, you know, I know some people, you know, they'll have a bracelet that says, you know, has some some information like do not resuscitate or something like Mm -hmm. that. Uh, How how do I let people know that I have one of these? So once you have completed your advanced directive, you give copies to your decision makers. So in the advanced directive, I think you can list up to two. Um, Some of them, you know, if it's more of one, you go to a, a, like a law firm or, or something, there's some documents that are also online, you know, where you can have a tertiary, you can have three, Uh, But a lot of them, just standard forms, only have two. Um, So you've listed, let's say you've listed three people that you'd like to, you know, make decisions for you. Give them copies of it. Um, They need to know what's on the document. And when you give them the copies of it, talk with them about what's in it. Don't just say, here, this is an advanced directive. You know, this is what my wishes are. And let's not ever think about it again. Um, So handing that document over and talking about it with them once you pass it on is really important. So making sure they have a copy, making sure your doctors, it doesn't matter if you've got a nephrologist and a cardiologist and a PCP, all of them should have copies of it, just so that way 
it's available. Um, if you're on dialysis, the dialysis clinics, they love, 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 love to have that kind of stuff on file. So if you have one um, and you haven't given it to your doctor, you haven't given it to your loved ones, um, you know, dialysis clinic, that kind of thing, absolutely make sure everyone has a copy. Keep the original for yourself and make sure that your decision makers, your loved ones, they know where it is. You know, it's stored in a lockbox, a safe, filing cabinet somewhere, along with my other important documents. Um, I can't tell you how many times I had clients come, or I had patients come in who, you know, came, came in with a stroke and their family is distraught and they've never talked about advanced care planning. They don't know where any of the documents are. They mm. don't know if they have a, a um, you know, any type of POA in place. And it's on top of them already being in crisis. Now they're having to search for documents and they're having to do all this problem solving. And so it just adds an extra layer of stress that is it, it's unbearable to, to watch sometimes. Yeah, Nancy says she has a small note she keeps with her driver's license, which is a great idea to let people know that you have this. And, and I would make sure that it's signed, um, so, you know, so make sure that it's signed. Um, and if it's like a small note, make sure it's witnessed. So that way it can be somewhat of a legal binding document, right? So is, if she, if uh, Nancy, if you've got it in your wallet with your driver's license, just make sure it's signed and it's witnessed. It doesn't have to be anything fancy um, and it's dated just so that way, you know, it is like a somewhat of a legal binding document that they can look at. <clears throat> yeah, and Helen asked a great question. Um, pretty much, do you need one for each doctor or can one of these documents cover all the different doctors and different issues that could come up? Yeah, so I would highly recommend um, in your advanced directive, getting very clear about the specific interventions you'd want. So in an advanced directive under life-sustaining treatment, um, it talks about CPR, it talks about dialysis, it talks about, um, you know, needing a feeding tube, that kind of thing. So these are very basic discussions um, that are kind of broad, but there are sections in certain advanced directives where you can write out, and I highly encourage you to do this, so to, to write out specifically if I need CPR and I need to be intubated, I'm fine with that. Um, if I need to get a trach and be on a breathing machine for the rest of my life, I'm fine with that. Um, and so really getting curious and getting very um, specific in a sense when you're talking about things like the heart, the kidneys, um, the lungs, you know, nutrition, talking about each of these things. So that way your loved ones and your doctors know where to go um, while also giving them the opportunity to really understand. So for some people being on a breathing machine, you know, uh, getting a trach and having a machine breathe for them for the rest of their lives, they're totally fine with. And some people are like, absolutely not. That's not for me. So this is the document where you really outline those things, but you don't have to complete one that's a cardiac advanced directive or a dialysis advanced directive. This document here is inclusive of all of that. And if you need extra pages, right? So you're writing and you're, you're stating, you know, in this situation, I would, I would want dialysis. I'd want, I'd be fine with going to dialysis for the rest mm -hmm. of my life. Totally fine. Um, under this circumstance, I wouldn't want it. And you start running out of space in the advanced directive, add extra pages. Just make sure that you number the page, you sign it and date it. Um, that way nobody can add things later. That way, you know, we know the document is complete, but that's a great question. You don't have to have one specifically for your nephrologist, specifically for the cardiologist. It's one document that you provide to everyone. So everyone is on the same page and go ahead. Oh, no, no. I was going to uh, talk a bit about the myths because you mentioned earlier there, there are some myths and I was wondering right. what those were so we could, uh, you know, make sure, you know, if anyone's thinking, oh, this is how it works and that's a myth, you know, we could address that. Yeah, yeah. And before I forget, I do want to just add one extra thing, you know, with these questions and with these decisions of life-sustaining treatment, talk about this with your doctor. 
Talk about it with your nephrologist. Talk about it with your cardiologist uh, because they can give you really, really good insight based on your age, your condition, you know, all of these things, you know, specifically, this is what you can expect. This is what CPR actually looks like. It's not what it looks like on TV. Um, this is what intubation actually looks like. So you can have a very, very educated decision when you're completing the document. So I just wanted to throw that out there too, that, you know, absolutely involve your doctor in these conversations because that is crucial and they can give you some amazing insight um, and help you guide to make sure that the document is accurately reflecting what you want. Now, before we get, get to the question mm -hmm. I asked a moment ago about myths, that brought up another question. Um, the incubation. So with COVID, some people have needed it, but it ha it's not a, um, a for the rest of your life type thing. They're doing it while they're treating you. Um, does the advanced care directive trump something like that if you wrote in there that you do not want to be and, you know, having machine breathing for you? Because I was thinking, oh, I don't want to spend the rest of my life on a machine, not thinking oh, I may have to do it for a month or so while mm -hmm. I'm being treated. So how, how right. does something like that work out? Yes. And so that is when the team, your, your medical team, gets in contact with your loved ones and your social worker, of course. Um, so we sit down and we talk about it. We say, okay, Lana was brought in. I see she's got an advanced directive that says, you know, she would never want to be intubated. But we think that she could reasonably recover from this. This we do not think is going to be a permanent situation. Why don't we take this into consideration? So it's a very individualized, um, intuitive and mindful and educated discussion that is not easy. So a lot of times the doctors would look at the advanced directive and they would really want to know who that person was, right? Which is why we have it. And the way we do that is by learning from the loved ones. So they take into account their wishes. They take into account what they expect treatment prognosis and recovery to look like and really make an individualized um, treatment plan based on that. So the document serves as a guide. It is your wishes. You know, it is honoring your voice. But that's why we identify these decision makers, right? So... Let me give you an example. So my husband is my secondary on my advanced directive because there are certain things that I do not want um, in terms of healthcare that I know him, he would say, yes, let's do that and let's do yeah. that forever because he loves me, right? So <clears throat> my best friend um, is actually my decision maker. And that is because I think she would be able to hear the information the doctors were giving her and wouldn't be so overwhelmed by emotion that she could make a judgment based on if Lana was sitting in this room right now, listening to what the doctors were saying, would she say, okay, yeah, you know what? Let's do intubation for a month. You know, let's do dialysis for a while. Fine. You know, so that is why we identify people because they take into account that this document is a static document and it does not encompass every possible situation we can find ourselves in. So that's why we rely on our decision makers to take that information and, you know, interpret it and hopefully honor our voice in the way that we would if we could participate in the conversation ourselves. I hope that yeah, makes that, sense. That makes a lot <laughs> of sense. Um, I could see, you know, your husband being too close to you to where it's difficult to see past the emotional connection to make mm -hmm. the decision that you would want to make, which may be something that's painful for him to make. Whereas right. a friend who knows you well enough, you know, while they're still emotionally connected, there's maybe a stronger bond where they're like, uh, she really wouldn't want that. Mm -hmm. This is what she would want. Yeah, that definitely right. makes sense. I could, I could see that. And, you know, my, my best friend, she's had her own struggles with loss in the past and you know, unfortunately, she's had these struggles, but I think it's helped her to kind of see things in a, in a way that allows her to really just dig deep and try to really understand. But also, you know, she has that empathy, right? Like, and 
Mm-hmm. So I, I, so obviously my husband would be included in all these discussions. It wouldn't be like, she's the only person that the doctors are going to talk to. Um, but at the end of the day, she would be the person to make that final decision. And you're actually I, doing I him a hear, favor. You're taking that is. burden yes. off of his shoulders. Cause you know, some decisions yes. will be really difficult for him. And, yeah. You know, I know that there could be decisions you have to make for a loved one that are the right decision, but it could bother you second guessing yourself going forward and it removes that. Right. Yeah. And I always hear people say things like pull the plug, like I'm pulling the plug on my loved one and that like hits me in the heart, (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. you know, and when we have an advanced directive and we're saying, I would not want certain treatment by having this document, it's me saying, this is not what I would have wanted. It's not, it's not pulling the plug, quote unquote, it's honoring what that person would have said. Exactly. Um, And then going back to that question that the nurse had asked a few minutes ago about, you know, having, not having a loved one, right. Mm -hmm. In completing this document, in addition to speaking to, you know, your primary care physician, then what ends up happening is we go to what's called two physician consent. So if the social worker cannot find a decision maker anywhere, like if this person's all their loved ones are gone, they have no friends, no anybody, um, then what the doctors do is they look at any existing documents, any previous conversations that they may have had with the patient and previous hospitalizations, and then two physicians have to consent to treatment or to determine that what we are doing is causing more harm than help. And that's a really difficult decision. So even if you don't have a loved one to make decisions for you, having this on file um, ultimately does still honor your voice and allows your doctors and your healthcare team to make that best decision possible. Yeah, and, and my takeaway from all of this so far and, and having gone through this recently with one of my cousins is it's their voice. It's what they want. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it, it kind of sounds gloomy when you're talking about it because you're planning for things you really would like not to happen. Right. Something, some of the things you're planning for won't happen, but mm-hmm. you're saying, hey, if this situation arises, this is what I want. Here's here's what I would like. These are the decisions now that I can think clearly right now Mm -hmm. that if I was in that position, you know, I would like, it is their voice. And someone had mentioned earlier that it removes all that so much stress from the situation. Yes. Um, And a lot of those decisions could be difficult for your family and your loved ones to make or to even question, is that what they would want? Is this the right decision? Mm -hmm. And, and I know from past situations that I've seen, this this could end up with a family disagreement. Um, As a matter of fact, I know one that's still Mm -hmm. going on strong decades later. Yeah. Because everyone is, everyone's emotional. Everyone's, you know, has a different view on health and wellness and death and dying. And that absolutely comes into play. So when you have a patient coming into the ICU, you're not really dealing with the patient, right? Well, as a social worker, I'm not. You're dealing with the emotions and the tensions and all of that familial stuff that's going on and trying to manage that on top of managing their acute stress and Mm -hmm. managing these questions they have and all these things they've got to sign and learning new terms and phrases that, you know, no one ever thinks that they need to, that they should know. Right. Um, I learned more about the brain than I thought I ever (laughs) would know working in the ICU. Mm -hmm. And so it saves that too. It saves that argument because, you know, I might say to my husband one day, like, you know, Oh, if I was ever watching TV, if I was ever in a car accident like that, you know, I wouldn't want this or, Oh, you know what? I would be okay with that. I would be okay with this. And so we get like little bits and pieces and everyone kind of makes up their own narrative. Right. And it's not that they want to harm someone or, or, you know, anything like that, but there is 
this narrative that we kind of build up for ourselves, but there's also so much emotion tied because a lot of people associate transitioning someone to comfort care if it does get to that point mm -hmm. with giving up. And that's not entirely, that's not entirely true, right? So it's exactly when we, when we choose to transition someone to comfort care, it's we are shifting our hope to something else, which is comfort, peace. And there is a lot of emotion tied with that. And if I am the person making that decision, I'm going to want to do everything forever because I don't want to give up. That's the person I love. And you can't tell me otherwise. So that is why this document is here. You know, I can, I can be really, really sick in the ICU and my best friend who I have listed as my primary, she can go against all of my wishes. I mean, if she thinks that's what's going to be best, I have no control over that. But what I have here gives me the best possible choice and the best possible chance um, to let my loved ones know what I want, have that dignity, and then have my healthcare team also honor that as well. Yeah, and 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 we've kind of talked about the benefits to the to your family and relatives and loved ones, but mm -hmm. it's also a benefit to you. Um, just thinking about my cousin last year, she planned everything out, um, and then she was kind of free to focus on kind of a bucket list, and you know yeah. we did things. She wanted to she wanted to go to a new state. She had never left the state of Ohio, so she went. She wanted to go on a boat ride. Um, we went and did all these things that she wanted to do because mm -hmm. all of the other difficult things were already taken care of. And we yeah. all knew she planned everything. Everyone knew what it was. And we just were able to focus more on the positive. Okay, well, let's mm -hmm. go. Let's have fun. Let's do things. Here's what she wants to do. She wants to get a new apartment. Um, uh, there were things that she had never done in her life. She wanted to do, and it, it really helped her final months be very positive, um, mm -hmm. and building memories and, you know, just, it was so much easier for everyone, including her. Yeah. And were there a series of discussions about her wishes or was it? kind of a one and done, you know, where did, how did that kind of go for your cousin? It was quite a bit in the beginning. They had to plan. I, they went through a lot finances. Who's going to pay the bills. Who's going to, you know, how does the money get from the bank to pay bills? If she's mm -hmm. not quite able to write the checks anymore or to, she didn't want to have that burden of remembering all those. So she yeah. went through Excellent. everything. Um, even, you know, what happens when she's done, you know, when, when she passes. Um, and then we had several large parties, you know, she wanted parties. We had big parties. Um, <laughs> it's getting me emotional remembering it. Um, it was just last year. So it's very, very recent for me, but, um, it was a number of conversations with select, you know, a, a small group of relatives, and then they let everyone know, hey, here's what it is. Uh, my mom was the decision maker. Everyone clearly knew it was my mom. If you had a question, if you needed access to, if there was money that she owed something, you went to my mom. She was the one who had access to the bank, made sure right. everything was taken care of so her her funds would last and she could do the things she wanted to and yeah. not be burdened with suddenly out of money. Um, as a matter of fact, some, some things did come up that were not expected and the kind of the chain of command and all of her decisions were used to help figure out what to do. Mm -hmm. um, and it also helped with her landlord. There were some challenges with the apartment she was in. She wanted an apartment, got her an apartment, um, wanted month to month instead of doing a year. So you know, my, my, my mom, I believe she was the one <laughs> was very, uh, um, outgoing <laughs> more than me. She went and she talked to the landlord and said, Hey, here's what we need. Boom, boom, boom. Um, got it all settled for my cousin on her behalf. Um, it just made everything so much easier for everyone. And it really just, 
it allowed her to focus mm -hmm. on um, the rest of her life and doing the most with it. And she didn't have to worry about people getting upset or arguing or any conflict, which that's not what she wanted. She didn't want mm -hmm. people upset saying, no, here's what she should do. Here's what she should do. She made it clear. So we all yeah. just focused on positive. She had a bucket list. Let's go get as many of these things done. Check, check, check off the list. Yeah, it gives you that sense of control, mm -hmm. you know? So because that's what we all want, right? We all want to have control and, you know, just be able to know that we lived our lives in the way we wanted. And once we pass on, we, we passed on in the way that we wanted. And I'm so thankful that you had that time with her to be able to celebrate her life and to, you know, honor her and honor her stories and make those memories and really help take care of those things so she could live the rest of her life in, in just such a wonderful way. And yeah, I, I she got to do that. things that because that. she thought all this through made it clear and it was all documented. Um, yeah, she was able to focus on doing things that she always wanted to do mm -hmm. instead of worrying. So what right. are some of the myths about creating one of these documents and kind of thinking about your future, you know, and making plans for it that kind of aren't the most positive? Yeah, so number one myth. Number one myth is talking about our death brings our death closer. And so I believe in, you know, manifesting things, right? So, you know, if you put it out in the air, you know, it's going to happen that, you know, I, so I do believe in that, but you know, as, as humans, we're not robots, you know, we're all going to get sick at some point. Mm -hmm. We're all going to pass on and nobody likes to talk about it. Nobody likes to think about it. Um, but it's inevitable. And so, in thinking about that, hopefully, you know, for me, it's 150 years down the road and I don't have to, my family doesn't have to worry about that, but I don't know. I don't, I really don't know. We're living in a pandemic and, you know, Texas is having, or they were having, you know, all of those really horrific snowstorms and ice and, you know, mm -hmm. people lost their lives and that's not something we ever expect to happen. So things do happen. Um, so, you know, it's a very, very difficult topic to discuss, but it does not cause you to die. It does not bring your death or, you know, a, a reduction in your health um, in any way. Like you were saying, James, in fact, it actually, a lot of times I could, I would think would improve it because it's giving you that power to say, this is what I want. I'm in of sound mind and cool. You know, now I can free myself up and we can literally go about our lives because I've got that written down somewhere. So that one was a really common conversation that I had to have with people, um, especially, you know, with different cultures and how they view death, how they view talking about certain things. You know, if you've got people who are very, very private and aren't really wanting to open up, you know, that's a really difficult conversation to have with someone. So even though it's difficult, um, it is a gift. That is the way I always frame it because it's absolutely true. So as difficult it is, as it is for you to talk about your own passing, it's that much more difficult for your loved ones having to, you know, deal with you being sick and trying to figure out what decisions need to be made. Mm -hmm. so that's the first one. That's the first one. Um, the second one that I hear a lot is I won't get treatment if I complete an advanced directive and I say, I don't want CPR. So that is absolutely not true. Um, so again, we talked about this a little bit ago where it's a discussion with your, it's an ongoing discussion with your loved ones, with your healthcare team, you know, with your doctor, and then also documenting it. That is like, you know, I, in this situation, I don't think I would want CPR, right? If, um, you know, if I get, if I get into a car accident and I have a traumatic brain injury to the point where I will never wake up. Um, and I'm not expected to recover. I don't want CPR if my heart was to stop. So, so there's these different situations, um, that you can identify in there. And that is why you have the decision makers again. So 
there are other advanced care planning documents that I talk about in my post that I haven't really talked about a lot here. Um, the other one's called the POLST. And so the POLST, um, that is a document that a lot of times you may see people hanging on their refrigerators. And it, every state calls it something different. I put the link to it in my um, blog post. Um, but the PULSE stands for Physician's Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. Maryland calls it Maryland's Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment, um, Providers' Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. So every state calls it something different. But what it does is it gives medical directives. So if EMS comes to your house and you have a PULSE completed that says, um, I would want CPR, I would want maybe some limited interventions to see you know, if I'd be okay, they're gonna do CPR and they're gonna take you to the hospital. If you don't have a pulse, they're gonna do CPR and take you to the hospital. Um, the advanced directive doesn't come into play until you get to the hospital because the advanced directive does not have a specific medical directive that was signed by a doctor um, or a nurse practitioner. So having the form in and of itself is just again a guide, the advanced directive. Um, the POLST, which again, look on the link that I sent and really look into that um, because that one is a medical directive. Uh, dialysis centers, they love to have those on file. If I, had, if I had a patient come in and I didn't know if they had an advanced directive, I didn't know if they had family who can kind of guide me in that direction, but I knew they were on dialysis, I would call the dialysis social worker every single time to get see if I can get an... Um, if I can get a copy of that or if I can get some information on it. Um, yeah, so I so it, it does become a little confusing, but the POLST again is the form that is a medical directive and that would say, no, I don't want CPR, maybe some limited interventions or yes, I do want everything full code. They take you to the hospital, they do all of that. The advanced directive comes in into play after and again, it's an ongoing discussion with your loved ones and your treatment team. It's not just a one and done. I hope all that makes sense. It can get yep, a little it sticky. Does. So another one is my loved one, you know, my decision makers would be financially responsible. So in this type of advanced care planning, when we're talking about health, like the advanced directive or the POLST, there is nothing to do with finances in those documents. If you wanted someone to do you know, handle your finances, make sure your rent's getting paid, you know, managing those types of affairs. That's a separate thing that, you know, you work out with, you know, an attorney, you work out with your bank. Um, that's not the kind of advanced care planning I'm talking about here. So having an advanced directive and having a pulse and identifying people on there to be your surrogate or to be your decision maker um, does not put them financially accountable for your hospitalization, for any decisions and treatment and that kind of thing. So that one I hear very, very often, and that's not true. Um, another one is I give up my rights to make my decisions once this is put into place, and that's not true. So we talked about it um, a couple times, but mm -hmm. the advanced directive takes effect when you are no longer able to make decisions for yourself. And that is certified by a doctor. So it's not just, oh, you know, Lana is a difficult patient and I don't really want to talk to her. Um, you know, I don't think it's, you know, she's going to be able to help me. I'm going to go talk to her daughter. No, it's, you have to talk to me because I'm the patient. Um, unless I explicitly state, you know, I don't really care to make decisions. Let my daughter or my son make all of them. That's fine. And that does happen. But the document only takes effect when you do not have decision-making capacity. Um, and conversely, you know, once you have lost capacity, let's say, you know, I have a stroke and I'm not able to speak for myself, I can't, you know, my loved ones can't complete an advanced directive at that point because I can't sign it, which is why all of this stuff happens in advance. Um, so, yeah, that's, those are typically the most common myths. There's, there's other little ones out there, but those are the ones that I hear the most often. Yeah, and, and yeah, I'm... The one about you give up your right to make decisions, the last one, that was actually the one I was thinking, you know, if I write this document, when mm -hmm. does it come into play? So it's great to know it's when you no longer can really have a voice for yourself. Right. right. So this is something we all should have, even if we're healthy, we should at least think these through, 
um, you know, create this, make people aware of it. But how do I go about actually getting started doing something like this? Yeah, so you can get online and you can you can search. So if you are Catholic, Jehovah's Witness, have some spiritual faith base, um, you can search Catholic um, Advanced Directive. You can search Jehovah's Witness Advanced Directive. And so your um, your church homes and your you know guiding bodies. They will have religious and faith-based specific um, documents that you can complete. You can also just Google advanced directives. Um, you know, there's not one that's per se better than another. There is the five wishes that people like that one a lot. So if you look, get online and look up the five wishes, that one's really nice because it breaks things down in a very, very nice way. The advanced directive that I use is actually the VA's advanced directive. Um, the VA's advanced directive, you know, I'm not a veteran, um, but the way that they have it written out is so beautifully done. I think that it's very specific, but comprehensive and really gives you the opportunity to really let your voice be put into the document. You can write in there and um, so on and so forth. So I love that one, but it's, you know, it, it's all up to you. So just researching um, is one way. I also highly recommend talking to your doctor about it. So your doctor's office should have posts on file um, that you can complete with them. Um, they should, a lot of them do have advanced directives as well um, that you can also get from them. If you are in dialysis, talk with your social worker. Um, your social worker will be able to sit down with you um, and kind of guide you through the process. You can talk with your nephrologist, you know, about, um, you know, if, if they uh, have any guidance on anything, but your social worker there should be able to really, really guide you um, with completing it. James, I can't hear you, my dear, I'm sorry. Whoops, no, that was me, I was still muted. <laughs> <laughs> Junior Grande one two three here had a good question. What's mm -hmm. the difference between an advanced directive and a power of attorney? So a power of attorney is a very very broad term, right? So you can be a financial power of attorney. Um, people, some states call it a healthcare power of attorney in an advanced directive. So a power of attorney is just the person that we go to um for specific things so it's a very very broad term so you can be a general power of attorney and that means you know you can handle things like um you know uh mail you can handle things you know like a state or that kind of thing but there's financial power of attorneys who can do things like bank accounts who can um you know sign over you know bills and all of that kind of stuff um, a healthcare power of attorney is just another term for a decision maker. Um, but yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. And how often should I update this? My dad, you know, posted a, a great comment to make sure and update it periodically. How often should somebody? You know, if your last advanced directive was completed in 1995, chances are it needs to be updated. Um, but in, in all seriousness, you know, the death of a loved one, I think often has us kind of thinking about things like, okay, you know, Ooh, is that really what I, what I would want? I know I completed it before. So that's a good one. Age, like your dad said is, is another good one. Um, being diagnosed with a new condition, you know, or having chronic pain and having, you know, that kind of stuff happening as our lives change, as our health changes, as we get older, these are all really important things. I would also make sure if you ever get divorced and it is your wife or husband that is on the advanced directive as your decision maker, that you get that changed. Um, you know, if your decision maker passes away, um, you know, or suddenly is incapacitated themselves and unable to mm -hmm. make the decisions, I would do that too. But I would say, I would say check it out every couple of years, you know, or as, as life events happen just be comfortable with kind of pulling it out and using that as an opportunity, you know, if things change to let your loved ones know. Yeah, and Good I think question. if if you went and checked it every so often, it 
-hmm. It'll make it even easier as you get older, because hopefully you don't need it early, uh, mm -hmm. but you got it just in case. But as you get up there in, in age, it's it should be easier to go in. Yeah, let, this is still good. I like this. And I maybe want to change what's mm -hmm. here. So I like that idea right. of going to it every so often. Yeah. Absolutely. And Nancy mentioned uh, power of attorney works only when you're alive. It ends the yes. minute you pass. Good point, Nancy. That's that's absolutely a very, very good point. It's very true. Yeah. All right. So we have discussed quite a bit tonight. Um, I know for some of you out there, you're thinking like, holy cow, it's, this is kind of <laughs> sad in a way, but this is something that really isn't sad. It's something that you know we don't want to think about our health getting worse and not being able to speak our voice and our wishes. But this is something that helps you, um, you know, give a gift to others by still being able to speak and letting them know in these situations, which are difficult, here's what my wishes are so that they can be honored. Um, yeah. And it, it's something that all of us should have. Uh, just, you know, to me, it's it's just like having a will. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I pass, who knows what happens? Well, I want to say what's going to happen. I want to make sure my wife, my kids are taken care of. Um, you know, and this is just part of that planning for hopefully what's far down the road, but we never know what yeah. can happen. Absolutely. It's, it's a gift to yourself and to your loved ones. I mean, there are so many situations in the hospital. I'm getting chills. Like some of them are running through my mind that were so much better that they had the document and it was able to really bring the family together because they were able to say, wow, you know, I am giving them an act of kindness. I'm doing, I'm giving them an act of love right now because I'm honoring their wishes. So I'm getting, I'm getting chills, um, you know, because that is, it's just so, so hard and so devastating to witness this pain and suffering that these people are going through and then also have this added stress of having to make the decision on top of it. It is, there is just such a, a peace most of the time when someone has completed this advanced directive and it gives your loved ones the opportunity to say, okay, this is an act of love and I'm gonna honor that. I'm gonna honor your voice and thank you for sharing it with me. You know, I wished we never had to be here, but thank you. You know, yep. it's, ugh, yeah. Yeah, and another, key word that you've when we discussed earlier that you mentioned was dignity mm -hmm. this this helps by by honoring my wishes you know there's that level of dignity also that comes along with it right right and a, a big one for me is you know i i am an active person i love to be outside i love to you know swim and and go for for jogs and you know make things with my kids. And so for me, not being able to do those things is something that I find incredibly important. And for a lot of people, you know, the loss of independence and autonomy is really for them where that dignity kind of piece, you know, mm -hmm. changes and it's different for everyone. But for me, you know, if I wasn't able to do that, I have to be very, very mindful of what would be okay and when would be okay? Like if I am able to sit up and do crafts with my kids and, you know, if I'm able to be in a wheelchair and, and you know, be like put into the ocean. Well, I don't know about being in a wheelchair in the ocean, but, you know, if my family doesn't leave me in the ocean in a wheelchair, you know, is that, is that, is that okay? And it's all about that quality of life. Mm -hmm. Where is quality of life for you? And, you know, every person's different and there are no right or wrong answers. Your answer is your answer, and it's fine. That's it's perfect. So, excellent. And this brings us up to the top of the hour. Now, for those who would like to learn more about advanced care planning, there is a blog post on Lana's website. I have a link mm -hmm. down below in the description, and there's her website address right there on the screen. Uh, it's 
Now, I'm so bad at pronouncing it. I know it's so simple, but I, I mispronounced the first part of it. It's not Hanu. It's Honu. 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 I'll get it. You give me time. I'll get it. <laughs> If anyone has any questions, you know, I can't give legal advice and I can't tell you what you should do. Um, but if you have any questions, maybe about something we glossed over or another question um, on my website, my emails on there, send me an email and I'll be more than happy to guide you into the right place. Um, more than happy to do that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here. This has been so informative and so helpful. And thank you everyone out there for joining us tonight. I have the next few nights off. I will see everyone next week on Monday with Dr. Rowe. All right, everybody. Have a great weekend. Bye.